Malcolm X told us to bring about change by any means necessary. Martin Luther King told us freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. And Rosa Parks told us it is better to protest than to accept injustice. So here we are, 60 plus years on, after the protests and demands, there's been change, but not close to enough. And when you still have racism in and out of the courtroom, you know you have a massive problem. There is no doubt about this. Look at the gang's matrix and its racist construction. Examine how the police bear down, humiliate and provoke through stop and search. Consider how in court, the state use the same racist approach when referring to rap and drill music and how they say that means the black guy at the back of the court is a gang member and murderer. And we are angry. And if you're not angry, then something's wrong. We need to turn up the volume in terms of our approach in court. New lyrics and a new soundtrack are required. Proactive, forceful, no more excuses. This webinar series is just the start at Garden Court. We have featured excellent black counsel, experts and academics. As Dave said, black is beautiful. Black is excellent. We have had six webinars and have had almost 1,000 people sign up. We have presented positive images of black youth and debunked the gang myths. We begin the next series on the 20th of January, 2021 with an international webinar on rap with Andrea Dennis and Eric Nielsen, co-authors of Rap on Trial. Brackets described as a smart and engaging book that will make readers mad as hell. Chosen by OK Player as one of the 15 great hip hop books published in 2019. Closed brackets. They will share the American experience with us here in the UK. It's going to be massive. And there's going to be a shift. There has to be a shift. Because one day we will ask ourselves how on earth the state was ever allowed to get away with using music to prosecute serious crime when the defendants were black. One day we will ask ourselves how on earth the state was ever allowed to get away with stopping people just because they were black. And so I encourage all of you listening to turn up the volume increase access to justice. If you haven't already set up or join or support a Black Lives Matter group in your firm, chambers or organization, support grassroots organizations, consider introducing a mentee system like Garden Court's access to justice, call out racism, protest and demand change in and out of your workplace. In the next six minutes or so, you're going to listen to 18 powerful voices. The youngest is 13. We have professors, footballers, campaigners, activists, doctors, and lawyers. They sum up what this Garden Court webinar series is all about. Demanding and getting change. They highlight the anger and rage 
that is experienced by the black community every single day. Together, the people behind the voices provide hope, inspiration, and rebut those racist stereotypes that the state has relied upon for too long. Turn up the volume and listen. Listen to the new beat. Hi, my name is Alana, I'm 13 years old and I'm passionate about the Black Lives Matter movement, debating, and someday I want to make a difference. In the future, I want to be a lawyer who can bring justice to people who may not always receive it. Hi, my name is Annie, I'm 15, I'm passionate about the Black Lives Matter movement, feminism as a whole, and climate change. I also really love singing. Hello. I'm Nyx, I'm 29 years old, a disability activist, a writer, and a Cambridge graduate. Hi, I'm Ibrahim Bai, and I aspire to be a lawyer to help increase the diversity and fair representation with people of all backgrounds in the sector, with the help of God and Court Chambers that have included me in their mentoring scheme. Dawn Butler just happened to be an unfortunate black person in a target borough that is being policed because of the, the so-called gangs, and it means that she is stopped and treated in ways that white MPs, I would suggest, would never ever be treated. The Garden Court webinar series on the state's oppression of black youth is an important and significant contribution to the debate on racism in the criminal justice system. We need to have a legal system that is reflective of the society that it serves. In order to have this, we need to have more black legal professionals, as well as black judges, to ensure that racism no longer goes unchecked within our legal system. Racism is a real problem in the criminal justice system, and the Black Lives Matter movement has placed a spotlight on the problem. Let's bring the protest into the courtroom. It's a racist stop and search, then we call it out as such, not just to our juries, but we bring the experts, we bring the statistics straight to the judge and stop discriminatory prosecutions before they can even begin. It occurs at all levels and things have to change this time. This webinar series has been a really important means of exposing the extent to which black youth culture has been criminalized. And with that, I'm optimistic or more optimistic that we might start to see changes in attitudes and practice towards things like use of gang narratives and reliance on drill music in criminal proceedings. The state should not be targeting young black men through their expressive culture. As this Garden Court series has shown, it's systematically and culturally racist. But I feel like there's real momentum and insight and partnership now to push back. My name is Elena Papa Michael and I'm a criminal defence lawyer. In my experience, anti-blackness within the criminal justice system is not subtle and it's not indirect, but it has become so normalised so as to be business as usual. I'm proud to have been part of the Garden Court webinar series on drill music, which has been forthright in calling out racism within the justice system. And it's also been leading the discussion amongst lawyers and experts into a concerning and developing trend of introducing music videos and lyrics into criminal trials where there's no link with the charges alleged. Most importantly with drill, it gives young people living in the United Kingdom an opportunity to escape the clutches of poverty and cycle of crime and be able to earn money legitimately through their talent and the creative process of music, which is drill. Drill is not something to be feared, it's something to be embraced and supported. This is an excellent webinar series. It breaks down what systemic racism is and how black people are criminalized by the state. If we want true equality, we need to dismantle systemic racism. And in order to do that, we need to understand what it is. It's no longer good enough to just not be racist. We need to be anti-racist and we need to be actively committed to eradicating racism in our society. 
this webinar series does a brilliant job at getting people interested and learning more about how to do that. It was really exciting to see so many practitioners coming together and seeing what practical things they can be doing on an everyday basis to challenge a system which we know has been and, and remains discriminatory and racist. For me going forward, I like to see a lot more people using abolitionist frameworks to support the community. Frameworks like abolishing the police, defunding the police and prison abolition work, you know, support communities like mine and actually enable us to um, see ways in which we can become agents of change um, in an oppressive system and also um, provides us with the tools we need to support our communities. Once Black Lives Matter, we are on the way to ensuring black liberation is a thing globally and locally. In order for us to see a real difference moving forward, we need everybody to remain unified and together and have a real desire to see change. One of the ways in which anti-racism can be brought into the courtroom is by not using or accepting lazy stereotypes being used to describe children, their parents, their family dynamic or their culture. This set of Black Lives Matter webinars have been inspirational and a real education. They are vital, but just the beginning. Join us in fighting racism in and out of court. No justice, no peace. To the Garden Court Chambers, I just want to say thank you very much for the work you're doing on the persecution and prosecution uh, of rap artists in the UK. Although our legal systems may be different, I think we can agree that the underlying forces at work here are very similar. And so I appreciate the work you're doing and I look forward to collaborating with you in the months and years to come. The use of drill music in criminal trials is a modern day government tactic that exposes the long-standing and widespread racism in the British criminal legal system. Here in America, the criminal legal system is likewise infected. As lawyers, we have a professional obligation to help break the chains of legal injustice. I hope you'll join me in the fight. Black Lives Matter. 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 Unity makes us stronger. Togetherness will bring an end to this. Black Lives Matter. I would suggest that's worth listening to again and sharing with all your contacts. Uh, there's a link for that now visible in the chat. So with that introduction, this panel, I can see them now, is fired up and ready to go. We have an excellent collection of brains and brawn tonight brought to you from the four corners of the globe. Me in Bradford, Becky in Manchester, Emmy, Emma and Talia in London, and Ali in Paris. I made the last bit up, but I do have it on good authority. He has been there. We encourage audience participation so please use the Q and A function. You are on mute and there's a whole series of rules and regulations uh, that you've all automatically signed up to, even if you don't realize um, on the chat um, function, you'll see that there. But we encourage you to put forward ideas, share them, links, uh, so all can see. The slides and handouts that the speakers will uh, go through will be provided to all of you tomorrow. So, how to exclude so-called gang evidence in criminal trials and challenging the joint enterprise narrative. First up is Emma, who will provide guidance and advice on how to oppose the introduction of so-called gang evidence in a criminal trial. Emma Fenn is a specialist criminal defense barrister with a particular interest in serious violence, financial crime, and child abuse cases. She is regularly instructed in a wide range of criminal cases in courts across London and throughout the rest of the country. She also conducts advisory work in relation to appeals and CCRC applications. Emma 
is ranked as a leading individual for crime in Chambers and Partners and the Legal 500. Over to you, Anna. So after all of the excitement of that video, Ali Badger and I are going to start this uh, webinar by covering gang evidence and, and how to try and get it excluded. The first half of, will be, uh, of that segment will be me and then handing over Ali to delve a bit deeper into the case law. Uh, we both know when we outline all of these areas that it is a tough task and one that uh, numbers of us have failed uh, in trying to exclude such evidence. But all we can do is keep trying to find new creative ways of, of pushing the system and to challenge the views that have already been established in the Court of Appeal. So the first half that I'll be dealing with is really the, the framework and some of the evidence that sometimes relied on and what practically we can do to both challenge the, the poor statistics often underlying that and the stereotypes, and, and then moving on with Ali going into a detailed precy of the case law. So I'm just going to share our slides and get started. And you'll see all of the speakers on that first slide there. But in terms of excluding gang evidence, Ali and I, to begin, the problems that we all know that are inherent in, in what the police and the prosecution and judges like to call gang evidence is it's a hugely racialized term. And it's often trotted out uh, with very little consideration and a huge amount of discretion on the, pros on the pre prosecutor's behalf. We end up in a situation where there are huge numbers of um, police experts in, ac across the country who are rolled out in cases to say very similar things over and over again. And what that leads to is a huge stigmatization of young people uh, because of friends that they choose or music that they choose to listen to or outdated sometimes years ago expressions of opinions on social media which really rarely go to the issues in, in the, the criminal proceedings that we're dealing with. And I'm sure lots of you, and myself and Ali included, have had countless examples of where that so-called gang evidence is dated. And you wonder what someone has to do to get rid of that word being against their name. Interestingly, 80%, more than 80% of knife crime incidents resulting in injury to an under 25 year old in London are found to be non-gang related, yet we are continually pushed with the, uh, the phraseology of gang wars and gang incidents and gang issues, gang problems, gang crimes. And that just continues to increase both across the press. And as you'll see it, the Court of Appeal have fallen for the trap in a case Ali will share later. But that vague term and is one which allows the police such discretion that it just leads down a road of further racialization of the term. Uh, when you look at the last bullet point on, that, on this slide, 72% of those responsible for gang flagged violence as defined by the police were black. So how do we compare the 80% the um, of knife crime being non-gang related and that 72% study uh, statistic. It's a real concern. And so that brings me on a little bit to the gang matrix, which I know has been covered in this series, but we really just wanted to revisit it, draw a few strands together. If you were at the webinar of Sta where Stafford S uh, Smith spoke, I know he covered it in detail, but it really does form a basis for looking and scrutinizing the case law as Ali will be doing. Created as a politicized response to the 2011 London riots, purporting to be a risk management tool with very little individuals, some 4,000 in number, find themselves placed on it. People from the age of 12, 99% male, and 27%, according to the Metropolitan Police figures, of those responsible for youth violence are black. But look at the statistics about the number of people on the gang matrix. And again, you find an incredibly worrying disconnect. 
This has led countless organisations to look at this issue, but one that's been featured before, and again, I just want to refer back briefly to it, is the Amnesty report published this year, Trapped in the Matrix. The first page there, Secrecy, Stigma and Bias in the Mets Gangs Database. 35% of those in that matrix have never committed any serious offences. 75% victims of violence themselves. 80% as young as 12 and up to 24 years old. And 87% from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. Again, we refer back to how that just shows a hugely worrying and racialized disconnect between the stats of what's actually happening, particularly on the streets of London and in terms of who is at the root of youth violence. But perhaps one of the most worrying things about the gang matrix is the lack of procedural protections. We're all well used to the procedural protections in a criminal trial. And whilst we don't always agree with how judges operate their discretion or apply the legal rules, the gang matrix is, is really a vacuum of procedural propriety. Discretion in terms of how people are put on it, no clear processes to correct errors or make amendments once you've made it onto the matrix, no formal method of challenge for individuals placed on the matrix or those wanting to try and get themselves removed, and no way of knowing if you're even on it. Given that this information is shared throughout the criminal justice system, across numbers, a number of agencies far and wide, including ones that can affect criminal justice proceedings, it's astonishing that you can be on it without even knowing when so many other agencies might be alerted to it and it might affect your life in such a wide way. And that goes back really to what I was saying before. How do you shift the gang definition once it's been put on you because so many times, time and time again, 13, 14, 15 year old might be in the corner or the edge of a video, find that coming up in their criminal trials four, five, six years later. So many times individuals who have stepped away from a group of people later to be told that yes, you may not be associating with them now, but you remain a member of the supposed gang and your loyalties haven't been extinguished despite the period of time because those loyalties of course run so deep that once someone has said you're part of a gang it's virtually impossible to shake it. But what can you do in your cases on a practical level? As I said at the start of this uh, presentation it's not an easy task. We are up against it in keeping a lot of this evidence out of criminal cases. A lot of what's on this slide is what you already do, but all we can do is keep going, keep trying new angles, and often go back to basics. Gain as much information as possible as you can of the background. So if the, the, ne if the time nexus is weak, and that there has been some real break or change, you can do your best to shift somebody away from being defined as within a gang when that might be four, five, six, seven years out of date. Consider instructing your own expert if the Crown are doing the usual of relying on a police officer to go into gang background or association, or if the Crown seek to rely on intelligence reports that may have placed you onto the matrix. We have heard from a number of potentially suitable experts throughout this webinar series, and that's really shown us that they are there and we should use them. And sometimes, even if they don't end up being called in criminal cases, the fact of serving that report and putting that into, into the proceedings can really temper where a police officer's evidence may go, because they are they are then in effect put under pressure by the fact that there are people who have statistically analysed or, or gone into greater detail 
on, on one side of it, even if they might have more practical experience. And that enables you then to challenge some of the prejudicial methodology that underlines that police expert so-called evidence. You can, there's nothing to stop you relying on the Lamy review or other independent reports into the overuse of gang terminology, including the Amnesty report that I've just shared uh, some very small extracts from. There's a section within that which talks about how the gang matrix may breach human rights laws. Be, be brave in how you approach uh, your cases and, and what you consider doing. And then again, talking in the context of, of why it's hard, there are sometimes such clear cut applications that we have to get creative. What can you do where you feel like your back is so far against the wall that the judge is going to wave through this evidence? Don't give up. Make sure you give the judge as many possible alternatives so that if they're going to admit the evidence, they've, they've ignored eight or nine of your suggestions before they do so. Ali and I had this in, in a case that we did. We gave the judge around seven or eight alternatives um, short of admitting everything. Granted, I think she probably went for one up from the bottom uh, and it wasn't perfect, but we'd made her work to put that evidence in. So here some some bullet points as to what you might be able to consider doing. Draft agreed facts to deal with the real issues the Crown want covered. If what a lot of this goes to is knowledge or association with individuals and an agreed fact to show that you, you accept knowing those people is sufficient, then go with that. Sometimes that is nowhere near as difficult as what you might otherwise end up dealing with. Don't just think that if a video has been served and the Crown want to admit it, that it comes as a package as a whole. Can it be cut to screenshots, stills? Can the uh, lyrics or the audio be removed? Again, does it really go back to association and links to individuals rather than the content of the video itself? And beyond that, if you do have to have the lyrics or you do have to have the audio, make sure that you restrict prejudicial or relevant sections. So for instance, sometimes there are misogynistic areas of, of the lyrics. What issue does that go to? And Ali will talk to you about the case law that you do have to still keep under scrutiny the issues in the case. So make sure exaggerated statements, misogynistic comments, things that really are completely irrelevant, you're, you're getting those excluded before really you even have to get to arguing with the judge because the crown should see the force in that in most cases and so the checklist before we hand over to Ali is what are the issues in the case how is the gang evidence sought to be admitted relevant to those issues is the crown's witness appropriately expert to give evidence about gangs and don't forget to, to challenge that. Does the evidence survive a qualitative assessment? You might think on first glance, what does that mean? But Ali will tell you more. Is the evidence more prejudicial than probative? Is any evidence being admitted under Section 98 to do with the facts of the offence? Or is it going under the bad character route under 101 of the Criminal Justice Act? And finally, what legal directions need to be given about the use that can and cannot be made of the evidence. Vital protections are often needed in those kinds of cases and do not let the judge try to gloss over those. It, it can often be that that is, is what will really save um, a previous ruling that you are upset or disagree with. There's not much to say about the routes to exclude evidence. There isn't anything creative or groundbreaking here. It really is the basics of opposing the application in the normal ways, whether by arguing it's not Section 98 and therefore forcing the Crown into the bad character provisions, or whether simply opposing a bad character application. Next, the, the two, in effect, discretions to try and argue that material shouldn't uh, be going in the unjust to admit it section within uh, the bad character provisions, section 1013, as I've stated there, and then the residual exclusionary discretion under section 78. 
whether you get there or whether the judge has already in effect found against you on the previous exclusionary discretion, uh, it doesn't mean that it doesn't still exist and isn't a route available. So handing over to Ali, he's going to now go through that checklist in effect, uh, but with an eye on the case law. Thanks, Emma. Um, I want to say bonjour, everyone, from Wanstead, the Paris of East London, as it's now known. Thanks, Kier. Um, I'm going to ask Emma to bring up the first slide, which will take us through the seven cases, Court of Appeal cases we're going to look at. We'll look at two cases at first instance as well, which I hope will help. So if we bring up the first slide, just gives you an overview of the seven appeal cases that I'm going to take you on a whistle-stop tour of. Um, you'll see from the slide um, headed overview that all the seven appeal cases that we're going to take you through uh, were unsuccessful. Uh, in each case, the gang evidence was admitted. In each case, the Court of Appeal said it was right to admit it, and they didn't overturn any convictions on the grounds of any other um, failing that was complained of in the case. So you may think that drawing attention to these in detail before your tribunal before whom you're trying to exclude gang evidence or to add um, some sort of specific strong direction to the jury if it is admitted, you may think they're not much help on their facts. But the authorities, the seven that we've um, highlighted, these are the seven most recent and most important cases on the admission of gang evidence. They help with firstly the framework that you should adopt in terms of presenting your arguments to exclude and if you fail in excluding to limit and if you fail in your argument to limit or at least succeed in part the direction sh that should be given to the jury. And the principles are all set out littered amongst these uh, seven cases. Uh, we uh, maintain in fact that there is scope still despite the seven unsuccessful appeals Within the cases, if you draw together a number of the key points that can assist, there is scope for the wholesale exclusion of asserted gang evidence or the limiting of the gang evidence that should be admitted. And for any gang evidence that does go in, a judicial direction by whichever route this evidence goes in, there, there's very strong grounds within this case law for drawing on certain dicta and saying a judicial direction must be given to limit the prejudice uh, to the jury by reason of its admission. So turning to the first of the cases of Sewell, and we go back in the case of Sewell to 2013, um, in which this is not one of the cases in which I think one can complain most about. There are others that I think are much more problematic and, and troublesome. But this one, in fact, um, the Crown, you can see from the slide that we, we have up, the Crown sought to admit um, incidents of tit-for-tat gang violence in three months leading up to the murder. And I'll just give you an idea of what that means. The, the deceased in this case was a man called Walters. Three months before the shooting, in fact, um, there was a shooting between cars in which one of the cars had the defendant in it, in the other car was Walters. Uh, that was three months earlier. Two weeks after that, there was a shooting uh, at the car in which Walters' brother was sitting. And two weeks after that, um, a co-defendant of Sewell had his car shot at. And finally, seven weeks later in the alleged murder, uh, there was the shooting at the um, man who was believed to be Walters, in fact, turned out to be somebody else. Uh, and so it, it, it's apparent, actually, if you look at that history, it would have been, the Court of Appeal found, unfair and wrong for the jury not to hear that there was that tit-for-tat history, which would help the jury to determine whether, in fact, the defendants were involved on the day in question. So this evidence was admitted. The real point of this case of Sewell is that the case um, uh, permitted the admission of the evidence, not as bad character, and something turns on this, which I think is something that is worth arguing. Um, the court came to the view that this evidence was admissible, in fact, under Section 98. And for those who aren't familiar with this, um, uh, Section 98 is where evidence is admitted as having um, the, the events that are sought to be admitted having to do, or the events are to do with, 
the um, offence that is alleged. So the Court of Appeal said that, in fact, this history of three months of tit-for-tat violence was to do with the offence in question because um, it's relevant to motive. And, and so the court came to a view about the admission of the evidence, which, which is problematic um, because once one is permitting evidence in by reason of it being evidence of motive and under section 98, two things the court found turned on that. The need for there to be a close chronological connection, a temporal connection between the past events and the offence that's being uh, currently alleged was no longer strictly required. That's the first thing that follows. And the second thing is that the full bad character direction, it could be argued, didn't have to be given because the evidence was not being admitted as bad character, but to do with the alleged facts of the offence. And so that, that's created a bit of a problem, the Sewell ruling uh, in the future. And, and I'm gonna suggest that as we go through the case law, one should not lose sight of the fact that even when the evidence is admitted under section 98, and there's a case I'm gonna to come to, which makes this clear, the courts have to recognize, the judge has to recognize the prejudice of that evidence. And so in those circumstances, there is still a very strong argument that the evidence uh, should be the subject of a strong, judicial direction, a bad character type direction, even when it's admitted under section 98. And so the last comment that we make about the case of Sewell is that um, don't ignore the chronological proximity or lack of proximity in terms of an alleged motive for the shooting. The longer ago the past incident, which is said to provide the motive, the more you've got a sensible argument that it doesn't provide very strong probative evidence of a motive and therefore stronger grounds for exclusion. And of course, in non-motive cases, the older the events, the younger the defendant at the relevant time, the more you've got a strong argument for exclusion. The, the absence of a need for there to be a temporal connection is only in motive cases, strictly as a matter of law. And you can still use, of course, the age of the offense, the age of the defendant very much in uh, your favor in seeking to exclude. So turning to the second of the cases of Lewis, this is a slightly more troubling case than the case of Sewell. Um, just running through the facts of Lewis briefly, um, and I mean very briefly because we've got seven cases now to get through in, in about 15 minutes. In the case of Lewis, a 2014 case, there were the 2011 riots were going on around the country and a number of people, 40 or so people, congregated around the area of a pub. The pub was set on fire. There was um, obviously the attendance of the police. Uh, there was shooting at the police. And uh, when a police helicopter turned up, there was shooting at the police helicopter. The prosecution wanted to bring in evidence of the gang association or membership of the defendants because they said it rebutted their defense. They said that what had happened on this night in question, in which the shooting had happened at the police and the police helicopter, prosecution argued was something that was characteristic of gang activity, gang violence, which is you know, obviously involving a bit of a generalization and um, is fairly sweeping. But the suggestion was that this was the type of activity which the jury would be assisted in knowing that the defendants on trial had either membership of or alleged membership of or association with various gangs. Now the trial judge allowed the evidence in. Some of the evidence that was being sought to be adduced was video evidence, the classic uh, video in which somebody's part of a music drill or rap video online with this usual sort of lyrics that are suggestive of violence and other gang activity. The judge actually took a quite a conservative view there and said that um, if, if uh, I mean favorable to the defense by way of conservative view, the judge said that he was going to not allow the prosecution to adduce evidence of gang membership or association where there was simply a single video involving a defendant in a single video. He said that that isn't enough without any more evidence from which I think any jury is capable of inferring um, gang association or membership. 
And the Court of Appeal, in fact, sought to water that down by saying, well, that, that is a, a view, and we won't criticise that view, but they went on to say, it's not to say, however, that an appearance in only one video will not, in appropriate circumstances, show gang membership or association, which is, which is um, slightly troubling. But that, that case, the um, court um, permitted the, um, uh, or said that the permission of the evidence to be admitted under here, section 101, 1D, relevant to an important matter and issue was, was, was um, appropriate. Leveson set out four questions. You'll see the first one uh, on that slide and then the others in the following slide. Um, there are four questions that Leveson posed on the facts of this case. And so Emma, if you bring up the second page, you'll see all four questions. I won't run through them, you'll see them there. But where in future cases, you'll see in the comment here, where in future cases people have, advocates have tried to argue that those four questions are in fact the test that must be applied in all gang cases. The Court of Appeal has it on at least two occasions said no, they are the questions that were appropriate on the facts of Lewis, but are not more generally appropriate. And so where at question three, you can see uh, Lord Justice Leveson said that the, um, one of the questions that the court must ask itself is does the evidence, if accepted, go to show the defendant was a member of or associated with a gang or gangs which exhibited violence or hostility to the police or links, um, uh, links with um, give me, uh, firearms. Well, that, that is not um, the test that the Court of Appeal said it should be applied in every single case. That is um, limited to the facts there. And so there have been cases where gang evidence has been allowed in, where there's no evidence that they have exhibited violence or hostility to police, no evidence that the gang has links to firearms, but nevertheless, the Court of Appeal has said that, where relevant, can still be admitted. So the next case of Myers, um, I'm going to, the third case, I, I'm going to keep this very short. This is, in fact, probably one of the most important cases on the admissibility of gang evidence that there is out there. And I'm going to suggest that rather than my run through the enormous amount of useful content that's in this case, that, that anybody who's arguing the admissibility or exclusion of gang evidence should read this case in full. It's the judgment of Lord Hughes. It's exceptionally clear. It's exceptionally thorough. And you'll find within it a lot of useful material. The appeal failed uh, for the reasons that Lord Hughes gave. In fact, again, it's hard to argue with the conclusion that the court came to, but there's a lot of useful material in it. And I'm just going to read you one paragraph, which I think is the most useful. When Emma has uh, rightly introduced that issue that you need to look at very carefully as part of your checklist, engaging in a quality assessment of the gang evidence that the prosecution seeks to adduce. Um, that really means uh, what Lord Hughes said at paragraph 68 of the judgment. And I'll just read it um, to you. Within the... Um, section of the judgment that permits a police officer to give quotes, unquote, expert evidence about um, gangs. What the court said in Myers was that the police officer's duty involves at least the following. And this is the qualitative assessment of the evidence that the prosecution seeks to put before the jury. Firstly, the police officer must set out his qualifications to give expert evidence by training and experience. Second, he must state not only his conclusions, but also how he arrived at them. If they are based on his own observations or contacts with particular persons, he must say so. And if they are based on information provided by other officers, he must show how it is collected and exchanged. And if recorded, how, if they are based on informers, he must at least acknowledge that such is one source, although, of course, he need not name them. Third, in relation to primary conclusions, in relation to the defendant or other key persons, he must go beyond a mere general statement that he has sources of kinds A, B, and C, but he must say whence the particular information he is advancing has come. An example would be observations of the defendant in company of others known to be members of the gang. If a witness statement tendered for trial does not meet these standards, the judge can be asked to direct that it's expanded in 
whatever particulars he judges necessary. And then finally, the uh, judgment goes on to say, it's necessary for the judge in every case to look carefully at the overall effect of the gang evidence to reach a judgment as the balance between legitimate probative value and unfair prejudicial effect. When assessing that balance, a highly relevant consideration is the ability of the defendant to test the evidence. It's likely to be unfair for the witness to state a bold conclusion, such as I consider X to be a member of M gang. The defense cannot be expected to embark on speculative cross-examination as to the basis for such a conclusion at the risk of inadvertently eliciting other inadmissible or unfair information. So use that and use a number of other things that are within the um, Myers judgment. One of the things within the slide that you have in front of you is that point about an officer's ability to rely on hearsay material. All experts are allowed to rely on hearsay um, when it's uh, hearsay material that goes to inform their expertise, but they're not allowed, and this is another point that Myers makes very clearly, to rely on hearsay material in order to assert facts. In other words, this defendant is a member of a gang and I rely on hearsay material. So make sure you're very clear about that distinction and don't permit an officer to stray from one to the other, the permissible to the impermissible. Um, and at the final bullet point on Myers um, is it, just a reminder that a police officer giving evidence as an expert on gangs must, like any other expert, comply with all the duties of an expert witness. And there are so many of them that are contained, I think, within part 19 of the criminal procedure rules, and they, they must be complied with. And I've insisted in one case that the judge require the expert to effectively make a declaration, the part 19 declaration, of the um, criminal procedure rules that they will comply with all the duties, including giving unhelpful uh, material to their opinion has to be advanced, disclosed uh, and declared in front of the court. So that's enough on Myers, although it is the most important case, I think, uh, within the seven, and it must be, I think, read cover to cover. Awiomi, the fourth case, I'll deal with uh, briefly. It's perhaps one of the most troubling case of all. And you can see perhaps why from the um, content. This is the point in which the court distance itself from that third question that Lord Justice Leveson had posed in, in Lewis. The trial concerned the shooting of a gang member. Uh, the um, charges were attempt murder and firearms offences. And the prosecution had the most vague evidence of um, gang membership and association, which I don't detail now, but it, it was pretty weak and it might not have survived, in fact, a qualitative assessment of the kind that Myers required. But um, the court, first of all, made it clear that, you know, that question three in the uh, Lewis case, there is no rule, they said, against the admissibility of gang affiliation unless there's evidence of gang violence, hostility to police or hostility, in fact, they said, between the two gangs. In this case, there was no evidence at all that gang A had a hostility towards gang B. Uh, and yet here the prosecution was seeking to adduce evidence that we have a shooting uh, or attempted shooting of gang A, and these people are members of gang B without hostility. And the Court of Appeal rather swept all that aside and said that the, and you can see this on the uh, slide, the, uh, they, they came to the conclusion that the evidence of gang affiliation was admissible because in their view, because this involved shootings, uh, and they described one uh, element of the offence as involving a return visit to finish the job, which is, just means that there was a second shooting. But uh, the fact that there were two shootings, they said, bore all the hallmarks of gang-related violence. And then uh, Aoyomi continues on the next slide. And they said the Crown could establish a possible motive. So we're back to section um, uh, 98. Although in this case, I think the evidence was admitted, in fact, under section 101. 1D, the Crown could establish a possible motive for the shooting, despite there being no rivalry between the gangs, and an association with firearms and lethal violence and could negative innocent presence and association. But as I said, with all, all these cases, there are fragments of material that can help. The court did say in Aoyomi, expressing some concern about the breadth of the material that went in, that docu the document should have been edited agreed facts made to avoid the jury learning of things they shouldn't have learned of. So even if gang evidence goes in, it can be properly limited. There are arguments that can be made. 
in Awiomi, um, there was an argument uh, that the um, police witness was insufficiently expert, and that might well have succeeded, in fact, at first instance. So Meyer's point was missed. But I'm afraid the Court of Appeal said, uh, on appeal, it's just too late, and we're not going to entertain the argument. But it's a reminder that you must scrutinise expertise very carefully when these things are happening and being played out at first instance. And then the legal directions. And this is the point I make about whether it goes in under Section 98, whether it goes in under Section 101. And often there's a crossover and judges will say, I'm going to allow it under Section 98, but if I'm wrong about that, I would have allowed it in under Section 101, 1D. In the legal directions, the court says in Awiomi, the judge must make it clear to the jury the basis upon which the evidence is admitted, direct the jury how to use the evidence, and warn the jury not to assume guilt, even if they found gang membership. So turning to the um, fifth case, I'll, I'll take this uh, very briefly, Stuart. Um, this case involves section 98. I, I mean, again, hard pass possibly to argue with this. Um, the um, uh, defendant, Stuart, was carrying a firearm and said, I was just a courier. And we had evidence, of, in fact, of uh, quite a lot of association with gangs and uh, images on his phone to do with guns. And so to rebut that defense that I'm a mere courier, in a sense, it's hard to argue the conclusion. There are useful things within the, the judgment of um, Stewart. Um, Section 98 case. So um, the court said at the end, you can see, given the evidence admitted by Section 98, the court said, it didn't make the conviction unsafe, although the co court was uneasy, plainly, with the fact that despite it going under Section 98, almost no directions were given to the jury about the care they should take. And the recorder, it's obvious, and you can see this from the middle part of the slide, excluded quite a lot of other material, which was not strictly relevant to uh, rebut that defense that he was a courier. And um, you can see the reasons why, the third bullet point, the most obvious, um, it's a generalised um, threat, um, and here the prosecution uh, only needs to rebut uh, that he was uh, a, a, an innocent courier. So that, that um, Stuart, has some useful things within it. Turn to the sixth case of Sode. This is a crossover case of Section 98 and 101. Um, the defendant said that he wasn't even there, uh, and um, the... Prosecution was allowed to call the evidence classically, again, as motive, but a lot of other evidence was excluded that the prosecution sought to adduce. And despite this being, the court found a Section 98 case, uh, paragraph 47 makes it clear, given the potential prejudicial effect of putting an offence in a gang uh, context. Um, however, we accept it's incumbent upon a trial judge to assess carefully the issue to which gang affiliation evidence said to relate and to make the kind of qualitative assessment of the evidence to which reference was made in Myers and upon which reliance was placed by counsel. So they, they are um, uh, ex, um, injecting that um, reminder that we must be very, very careful, even if the um, gateway to admissibility is crossed, not to go too far. Fender is the last of the seven cases. This one perhaps falls into a completely separate exception. You can see what um, the basis was for admission. It wasn't section 98. It wasn't section 101, 1D. It was that the defendant hadn't um, had gang evidence adduced against him uh, within the prosecution case, but went into the witness box and said a lot of things about his lack of association with gang members. And they went further still and said, I don't like gangs. They make me quiver. And the Court of Appeals said um, that opened the gateway. But extraordinarily in, in Fender, despite the um, gateway being opened and the prosecution being allowed to now rebut that false impression that was being given, um, something extraordinary happened. The uh, prosecution cross-examined the um, defendant on the basis of the police officer's expert report. One, um, he wasn't, it seems, properly expert. He had access to and relied very heavily on things that he really shouldn't have been relying on, including things like the gang matrix. So there should have been an argument there, but wasn't. Second, um, the cross-examination was done about the report, but the prosecution didn't end up calling the police officer. So we actually had an extraordinary state of affairs whereby the um, 
defendant was cross-examined about the conclusions within the report about his gang association, and then no evidence, in fact, was called to, to back that up. And so, well, the Court of Appeal let that go, um, only just, um, and we make the point in the comment section that you've really got to look very hard at the officer's expertise and the qualitative assessment examination has to be done. Let me turn to uh, two cases of first instance before I wrap up. I may have gone well over time, and if I have, I'm, I'm sorry, Keir. I have, I see a nod, but, but can't hear him tell me off. Um, first instance experience, just to cheer you up, uh, all is not lost. Two first instance cases, one TB um, in Birmingham Crown Court, both cases I was involved in. This was a shooting case. Um, the two gangs plainly came together one night uh, at a particular location. Gang A shot at Gang B. Um, gang B shot back at Gang A. And I can say gangs because there was pretty strong evidence there were two gangs. Um, the, the Gang B shot was the one that was the subject matter of the trial because it killed a member of Gang A. Every person who was a candidate for the shooting, there was a police officer, looked at the video footage and said, I think it's this person uh, and I think it's not the others who are all members of Gang B as well. The judge agreed with the submission. There was no reason to tell the jury that the defendant was a member of a gang because all the candidates for the shooting were members of a gang. So to tell the jury the defendant was would have been to tell them nothing that was useful, nothing that advanced the issue in the case, which is the identity of the shooter, because every single one of them shared the same characteristic. And so the judge excluded the gang evidence or didn't admit the gang evidence uh, in that trial. Um, in the case of JM, um, the uh, deceased's father and brother made witness statements saying he's not a gang member. This was a stabbing case. And there was some evidence of an, a, an issue, an event that had happened a few days earlier between the defendant and the deceased, which could have provided a reason for the stabbing that was said to have happened on this day. And so we were able to argue that the prosecution actually had no evidence that the deceased was a member of a gang. Uh, and couldn't be said to be, be mistaken for a gang member. And so motive fell away and the prosecution would effectively be interject, introducing a motive uh, of which they didn't have um, evidence. Uh, and so um, we were able successfully again to argue that that evidence should be excluded. So there are many ways I think in which you can argue for the exclusion of evidence using all the principles that have come out of those cases. Um, the conclusion, let's, let's turn to um, the last, I think, slide that I have here, which is be careful not to allow um, profiling a stereotype to form the basis of so-called expert uh, conclusion. Um, uh, you must make sure the judge takes it step by step to um, not permit any more than that narrow amount that might be admissible. Um, I would try to keep things out of Section 98 and bring them into bad character for the reasons I've already said, full legal directions and a proper analysis or a, a different analysis could sometimes be engaged in. And lastly, temporal connection is still not irrelevant, uh, despite the fact that a motive, it, it's not a vital, a necessary um, thing. It is still relevant uh, uh, for your exclusion arguments. Uh, and so thank you very much. I'll, I'll pass you over to the next section of the talk. Uh, can I thank both of you, um, Ali, of course, and Emma for uh, starting us off um, in terms of the law and the background facts that uh, we need to be mindful of um, in these sort of situations. Uh, we're going to crack on now uh, because uh, Ali did speak uh, for uh, five minutes too long um, and I'll deal with him later on. Uh, but we're going to get on to Becky Clark now, who's a senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, she's going to talk about the dangerous associations research and evidence from joint enterprise prisoners and about prosecution strategies that were used against them, along with criticisms of the prosecution approach or suggestions regarding rebuttal evidence. Becky will also refer to how the joint enterprise doctrine and prosecution gang narrative causes disproportionate punishment of black youth. So with a big virtual applause, here's Becky Clark. 
Thank you, Keir. Um, and firstly, thanks for inviting me to contribute um, this evening. It is certainly an important series. I have been doing research around gangs and more, more recently joint enterprise, but the gangs research stretches back over 10 years. Um, and it's great to see this kind of intention and advice and, and galvanising support for challenging the gang, which is something that I think has been um, lacking in so many of the cases that, that I've seen in the research and, and also in some of the observations I've done of some of the trials more recently. Um, I'd like to do two things, and perhaps the first one I'll do fairly quickly, which is really just add to some of the initial points that Emma made. Um, just giving that confidence to disrupt the gang further, whether that's through some of the more procedural mechanisms that Ali has outlined there in his input, or whether it is, as Emma says, really bringing some of the broader empirical evidence in the courtroom to disrupt the notion, the concept of the gang as it is assumed. Um, and then secondly, the second thing I want to do, and, and hopefully it'll kind of lead into Talia's input, is really bring to the fore the significance of the process of racialization, because the two things work together. Make no mistake about it, I think if the gang is brought into the courtroom without the signalling and the um, sort of linguistic cues and other strategies that use that process of racialization, it wouldn't be as rich a resource for the prosecution. And that's something that I'd like to kind of just develop and then hand to Talia to really look at, at some of the cases um, and the challenge to those. Um, you know, in order to disrupt, I think sometimes understanding that context of, of, of the use of the gang as a concept and it being brought into both the expansion of policing gangs, but also the use of joint enterprise. You know, we see the expansion of the policing of gangs, of gangs units, of gangs databases, of gangs lists, as Emma said, come out of um, really in response to the disturbances, the riots of summer 2011. And there's a real political and mediated narrative there that was flawed from the start, but it was allowed to run. So whether it's Ian Duncan Smith and his Centre for Social Justice saying that gangs were to blame for those disturbances, even though it was disproven, or whether it's David Starkey going on a racist rant publicly on Newsnight about um, the whites becoming black and Jamaican culture and all of those kind of linguistic racist signals that he gave in his input on Newsnight, we see off the back of that um, political and mediated narrative, um, the ending gangs and youth violence policy, which is where the money comes from to develop the policing um, experts and evidence that the prosecution are then bringing into the courtroom. Um, and, you know, it, it's taken some time, but we are really now starting to see the evidence being published that counters it. Um, so back in 2012, we published some information, um, some data in Manchester, and I'm going to start sharing now. Um, just go to here. We we begun to kind of gather this evidence together. Um, but it's important to say, I know many of you might be practicing in London, but this isn't just a London issue. You know, what we see is whether you're in Manchester, to London, to Nottingham, the gang that is policed is racialized. You know, in Manchester, 90%, almost 90% of those on the gang's database in Manchester were um, black or minority ethnic and very particularly black and mixed race men, as with the matrix. We see um, the statistics that Emma's already spoken to around the matrix in London, and I've also placed on there the Nottingham figures. And, you know, in the smaller charts, we can see the population. So we see that this is really disproportionate in terms of that police in the gang. So this is a national problem. It's not just a London problem. Um, slightly different way of representing a point that Emma's already made, but I think it's about, you know, recognising that the data and the information is there to bring into the courtroom to disrupt. So the orange and blue graphs are from Manchester and the grey and green ones are from London. We were very lucky to be able to persuade um, the analysts at the mayor's office in Mopac to replicate our Manchester data and demonstrate that um, whilst the majority of individuals who are being policed um, 
as gang involved or gang members are from the black community, the serious youth violence in both Manchester and London is not a distinct problem of the black community or of black um, defendants or perpetrators. And so, you know, I really would just make that point that Emma's already made, which is that, you know, there will be evidence available that it will be based, you know, as this is on police data that you can take into the car and really start to challenge some of those assumptions around the gang. Back in 2014, myself and my colleague Patrick Williams um, began a piece of research around the relationship between the gang and joint enterprise. And we, we wanted to understand that relationship. Um, we engaged in some research with almost 250 prisoners serving joint enterprise sentences. And I'd like to just cover a little bit of what we found in there. Um, as has been confirmed through other research, including Cambridge University study around long sentence prisoners, um, disproportionately those on joint enterprise sentences are black, Asian or minority ethnic of, uh, background. These individuals are serving long sentences, so on average for the whole group, more than 15 years. But those minoritized prisoners are serving longer sentences than their white counterparts. These prisoners are also likely to be younger than their white counterparts. So almost two thirds of them under the age of 25. And there are children being convicted under joint enterprise, um, you know, in these collective punishments. So we had a number of prisoners, 21 prisoners under the age of 17. All those children were black or mixed race all those children who were convicted under joint enterprise under the age of 18. What was also significant, and we'll see in a minute in terms of the strategies, is how many of those defendants as respondents were not at the scene of the crime when the offence was committed. So real heavy reliance upon that gang evidence, that police intelligence being brought into the courtroom. I'm going to come back in a moment with um, some, some of the prisoners' um, voices, but we commissioned a film um, last year by a local filmmaker in Manchester to bring to the public some of these issues. And we, we had a spoken word artist from Manchester develop a short piece. And I'd just like to show that piece now because I think it starts to encapsulate and place into the kind of historical and social context why this moment is significant because it represents a continuation of the um, racial disparity of the racism within the criminal justice system. So I think um, Amy is going to put the, uh, the film on for us now. Lady Justice has been peeping through her blindfold. The outcome premeditated. Her judgment seemingly predicated on prejudices that predate her statutes. Let's criminalize the black youth. Let's criminalize the black youth. Who said you are not your brother's keeper? We find you guilty by association. Lady Justice has been peeping through her blindfold. The prosecutors brought her bronze, not gold. And truth be told, her scales are feeling cheated. Her morals are depleted. Burden of proof is feather light. Application of joint enterprises more black than white. How can a man be expected to exercise foresight over something that happens in someone else's mind? Lady Justice has been peeping through her blindfold. Fingers pointed in the dark. Convict a gang when the script demands a fall guy. And the evidence is stark. Same as it ever was. Lady Justice has been peeping through her blindfold. Unable to see the grey between the black and white.
Sorry. Thank you, Amy, for sharing that um, piece. That's by Reese Williams, like I say, a, a spoken word artist in, in Manchester. And I mean, there's so many, so much captured there in terms of what we're seeing happening here in that short piece of spoken word. But I want to pick up in particular on this idea that it's the same as it ever was, because I think there's a danger that if we take a procedural only strategy to address the gang, we're not recognising that actually this sits in a much longer trajectory of the criminalisation of young people from the black community and the way in which these narratives and strategies are repurposed and reintroduced at different points in time, but rely on the same, um, the same processes of racialization that kind of reappear and are connected back to. So I want to just share again, some of the quotes from the prisoners and some of the strategies that are revealed through the evidence that they gave to our research project. So the prisoners contest the gang. Sorry, the graph on the right, I should say, is, um, is a recognition that the gang can also be used in trials with some white defendants, but to a much, much lesser extent. And also, interestingly, our evidence demonstrated that where a gang narrative or reference to a gang is used in trials with white defendants, it's not then developed in any other ways with other evidence, such as music lyrics, such as um, photographs or, or other sources from social media, such as the police intelligence. It's purely kind of a reference to the gang on its own. It's not coupled with this process of racialization that I would like to argue is just as significant as using the construct of the gang. We can see from the quotes here that there is a challenge um, to the use of the gang. There's people trying to make sense, you know, this idea of spontaneous violence. I think the final quote there leads us into some of the strategies. So the way in which the prosecution find it easy to call us gang members. But again, this is where the process of racialization becomes so significant because to share school photos or holiday snaps of yourself with the friends and family of a white defendant wouldn't have the same impact because the gang is a racialized construct, both in how it's been evidenced, but also how it's used in the courtroom. This is my final slide. And I'm just gonna to point to a number of different things on it before I, I kind of hand the baton over to Talia, who I think was going to pick up some of these factors um, in her input as well. So the strategies that are brought into the courtroom are the the things we've heard about in this series earlier, the social media, the videos, the rap lyrics, but it's also that police cell site evidence, in particular when individuals are not at the scene. The expert witness on the stand, the police officer, is there for a reason, and it's to place this case in a wider sort of um, story. It's kind of the new chapter of an existing story of gang folklore. So if it's in Manchester, the young people in the dock will be connected to an older narrative of gang. And in this way, the Evening Standard in London or the Manchester Evening News in Manchester are doing the job of the prosecution. You know, it's the, it's the stories that have already been planted in the jury's minds, in the local public's minds about particular communities or with reference to particular gang names, regardless of how historic those names are. So we, you know, I sat and observed a trial in Manchester um, in 2017, where the police expert witness on the stand connected the young people to gangs that were happening before they were born in the late 90s in Manchester, and even brought up images of black men on street corners in Los Angeles to say that the gangs that they, that they were suggesting these young people were connected to, which were not evidenced in any way, I should add, were kind of connected way back to Los Angeles, to gangs 20 years ago. You know, and these on the stand young people then are, are asked to kind of contend with these assertions and inferences that are being made about them. 
There's also the, the signaling, the linguistic cues of gang speak. This is a rich resource in the prosecution. So the defence have got to equally challenge this resource and have got to bring that evidence into the courtroom. But I think if there's one thing that I'd like to kind of leave as a takeaway from my input tonight is, and it's not to dismiss the significance of challenging gang evidence through those procedural strategies, because that's absolutely something that can be taken forward. But it's about the gang is, is one part of what's the problem here. It's used to signify the intent and the common purpose necessary in, for example, a joint enterprise case. But the, the, the process of racialization is just as powerful and is used in combination to signify that criminality and that dangerousness of um, the, the imagined black criminal. And I think that, you know, from our research, and there's, there's a link to a more recent paper there, Patrick and myself would argue that the racial injustice in these cases originates from a series of targeted and criminalising policies and practices that start with the police, that travel into the courtroom, and into the judge's sentencing, you know, sentencing as a, uh, gangs as an aggravated factor. It's a series of cumulative steps. And I think, you know, for defence teams, there's got to be an equally kind of multi-strategy approach to bringing some of this um, down and challenging it. Too often we've seen and we've heard from prisoners that the defence teams took silence as an option. Let's not talk about the gang. Let's try and ignore it or downplay it in not engaging with it. Let's not challenge those racist assumptions that are being brought into the courtroom about neighbourhoods, about um, the policing. So I think, you know, if we're looking at the ways in which we challenge the use of the gang, we have to challenge, uh, challenge the, the impact of the gang. We have to challenge both the gang, but also the effects of that racialization process that's happening in the courtroom. I'll hand to Talia now. I think we'll pick up some case issues there. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Becky. And it probably can't be put any better than this from Jan Cuncliffe, um, who says, academics like Becky Clark should be used as the experts when it comes to counteracting the so-called police gang experts. Couldn't have put it any better. So now we're going to hear from um, Thalia, who's going to pull everything together um, in the final summation um, and, in fact, the final contribution in this series um, on combating the prosecution's joint enterprise narrative and narrowing the issues in the judges summing up. Uh, Thalia Mirage is a barrister at Garden Court Chambers. Uh, she, uh, her practice has predominantly been defending in serious crime and acting for bereaved families in Article 2 inquest. And she's currently instructed on behalf of bereaved residents and survivors in the Grenfell Tower public inquiry. She's ranked as a leading individual in the legal 500 and has over 15 years experience as a criminal advocate. Over to you, Thalia. It would be good to have taken myself off mute. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, Keir. Um, and I'm conscious that we, I'm on the graveyard shift, literally, and we are running out of time. Um, as, as the last speaker, it is my duty to bring the strands together. And picking up from what uh, Becky has left us with, and also just tying together Emma and Ali's presentation, I will be looking at how the prosecution uses uh, the gang construct in uh, joint enterprise cases with reference to two cases. Um, how can we challenge the joint enterprise narrative? And, and that is something I'm gonna be pulling together from Emma's um, presentation, looking at the issues arising in the judges summing up and tacking onto that, um, I would be proposing some bold recommendations in terms of looking forward. Um, I want to start off or uh, my presentation with a, the, a clip, the trailer from the Dangerous Associations um, 
piece or, or a documentary that uh, Becky took her spoken word from. So I'm just going to go to share my slide presentation and Amy can uh, pick up with the, um, the trailer clip. A young black boy goes to prison for murder when sometimes they weren't even in the vicinity. The very first question from a client will be, well, I didn't stab anybody. I don't know why I'm here. It's heartbreaking. What is this thing, Joint Enterprise? How does it work? Why does it operate in the way that it does? How do you go from being someone with no criminal record to a murderer? It just doesn't make sense. Thank you. I'm just going to now go into my um, slide presentation. Um, uh, which does not seem to be coming up for some reason. Um, hmm. I'm not sure, Amy, if Amy, if you have turned the, the screen back to me. Here, I seem to be having a little bit of problem on my end um, with, with sharing my screen. Oh, no. Okay. I'm here now. Yes, thanks. Oh. Yes. Um, we, we ended the clip with uh, the voice of Gloria Morrison from Jengba asking the question, what is this uh, joint enterprise. And for, can I just ask, is everybody seeing my screen? Okay, great, because I had some accessible question here from, from Amy. Um, Sorry. So I start off with a quote from the well-known case of Jengbo, um, which sets out the definition of uh, joint enterprise. And I go into uh, breaking down the, um, the, the concept of joint enterprise with an extract from Archibald. And uh, just, just simply, you know, we all, those of us who practice um, in, in these cases, we all know uh, the definition. Um, it's where, our, where two or more persons embark on a joint enterprise. Each is liable for the acts done in furtherance of the joint enterprise. Um, that includes liability for unusual consequences if they arise from the execution of the jo agreed joint enterprise. But the other participants are not liable for the consequences of that unauthorized act, which goes beyond the tacit agreement uh, as part of the common enterprise. And this is where the, the, the final point is where the prosecution has some amount of latitude to uh, spread the narrative of, of the gang construct that we have been discussing, because it is a question for the jury to decide whether what was done was part of the joint enterprise or was or may have been an unauthorized act and therefore outside the scope of the joint enterprise. Now, I just want to turn to the use of the gang construct in joint enterprise cases, which is something that Becky had touched on. And this is where we see the realization of the gang construct coming into play and the prejudice which arises particularly for young defendants uh, from black 
and non-white backgrounds. So there is the reliance on, on gang talk where the prosecution draws on a ready-made narrative to construct the primary association necessary to infer collective intent. There is the use of gang talk predominantly in cases where defendants were non-white. And this is, this is taking, taken from some of the research done uh, by Becky and Patrick. There is a reliance on non-criminal conduct or associations with individuals who are suspect. So the innocent, an innocent friend, for example, with whom a defendant um, would have had an association uh, because they live area that is that sort of association is quite often used uh, as a part of the prosecution's narrative and utilizing the gang as a primary form of, of association prosecutors serve to symbolically communicate to the sentence of where the defendant has been um, convicted uh, and more importantly a, to the jury a, a story or a narrative that uh, supports uh, their case of this, of course, is it's criminalizing a, the, the culture because quite often the um, imagery or the, as we have seen in the previous um, seminars or webinars we have had, the use of music, um, the incorporation of images and videos of the defendants engaging in simple um, non-criminal behavior, but which may be given a spin or an interpretation um, that suits the narr narrative uh, and the prosecution's case. The use of photos, um, tattoos, or the playing of music videos or reading out song lyrics in court. Um, again, which may very well have an innocent um, explanation, but the criminalization, for example, of genres of music such as drill fits into this narrative and feeds uh, the two cases the case of games just illustrate um, how some of the uh, factors or the pointers that I've identified as a part of the that construct which is used in joint enterprise cases were deployed um, in uh, two cases. The first one, Johnson and Haynes involved uh, two defendants who were convicted of murder, and it included the appellant who was only 17 years old. Here, the deceased was attacked by a group of, group of youths, and the defendant was one of those present. The prosecution's case had all the tropes, in my view, of racializing uh, of a black defendant, and their narrative included uh, that several of the defendants were associated with a local gang, that um, the defendant was friendly with the, the person who was the so-called leader of this gang. And of course he admitted to knowing um, the so-called leader, but there was no evidence that the defendant had participated in any gang related activity. So here we see knowledge or an association, an innocent association quite often with someone who is designated a gang member and it is used to feed into the narrative of the prosecution's case. And again, using imagery um, as a part of the narrative here on arrest, the police had found artwork making reference to the SNM gang and three of the, his co-accused by their street names. Similarly, in the case of N, uh, the defendant was convicted of wounding with intent. And it was the prosecution's case that he was either one of the two at attackers or that he was in the vehicle to encourage the attackers if necessary. So not a participant, he was you know, merely present. And uh, again, the prosecution's narrative included that the defendant was a member of a gang and they adduced evidence of gangs that had operated in the um, New on Borough and presented uh, evidence of a, a drill video which featured the defendant and a note of lyrics on the defendant's phone in which he they interpreted again that he appeared to have described himself of boasting about the attack. 
Um, the defendant's account was, of course, you know, he denied taking part in the attack. And he said that the anyone, anyone can go group was not a gang, but an association of friends. And although he accepted that he appeared in the video, he denied that he was referring to the attack. Uh, uh, in the song. And again, you know, we see one narrative which is being present, presented by the prosecution, which is racializing, which is criminalizing a defendant by reference to, um, you know, a gang association, which could very well be uh, an innocent association. Uh, the, the, the criminalizing of music here and the interpretation of lyrics uh, and, and gestures in uh, a criminalized way. So how do we combat the joint enterprise narrative? Uh, Emma has taken us through by and large the roots of challenges in her examination of challenging uh, the gang narrative. But I want to touch on the importance of calling defense experts to challenge the uh, racialization uh, and construct presented uh, by the prosecution, the racialization of defendants, because it's important that we recognize that the narrative which is being presented quite often in cases which involve Black young people are devoid of an understanding and an appreciation of Black culture. And it's important that as defense lawyers, we instruct anthropologists, we instruct criminologists, we instruct eth experts in ethnography who can present on the defense's behalf the other side of the, the, the story. Um, and just to also touch the importance of instructing experts who uh, who present evidence of the cognitive the, the the cognitive development of of young people and the fact that which is now recognized um, in our criminal justice system but still has a far way to go that when a defendant turns adult you know reaches the age of 18 years old as the cases say that that defendant has not jumped off a cliff edge and it has been accepted that the neurological functions of young defendants are still developing and this affects their decision making process and we know as becky has pointed out that a significant number of the defendants who are brought into the criminal justice system are young people and who are brought in uh, through joint enterprise are young people. And it is important for us to um, instruct uh, such experts uh, to, um, to present you know, this sort of evidence as a part of our defense. Uh, in this respect, uh, I've identified the case of Lamar Gordon um, for the, the, the sole purpose of identifying and illustrating the importance of instructing the right expert to, uh, to, to present on behalf of the defense where there are um, cognitive development issues or mental health issues. This was a defendant, oh, he was uh, convicted of murder under joint enterprise, but he brought an application to adduce um, medical evidence on appeal. The appeal wasn't allowed, uh, but the significance of, of this case in my view is that it highlighted the importance of properly identifying um, any sort of mental health issues or any sort of cognitive development issues that affect defendants that can impact on the question of intention. Here, um, I had not been diagnosed with um, AASD um, at the trial, but subsequently on appeal, his uh, legal team instructed uh, a, a neuropsychologist um, and a forensic psychologist who came to the view that, uh, that he had been um, suffering from 
um, as ASD uh, and was actually on the uh, Asperger's spectrum. Unfortunately, the Court of Appeal uh, didn't uh, accept this. You know, they considered that this wasn't evidence that was brought at the trial. And he had been examined um, by a psychiatrist and a psychologist at the trial. But these experts gave evidence highlighting that, you know, ASD is not um, a a condition that would necessarily uh, be properly diagnosed and investigated at that stage. So again, just highlighting the importance of um, looking at the defendant, you know, in the round and instructing the right expert. So how do we narrow the issues uh, in, the, in, in the judge's summing up? Uh, and, uh, you know, as lawyers, as defense barristers, we head straight to the, the legal issues. And in most joint enterprise cases, there are supposed to be written directions and um, a, a route to verdict to assist uh, the jury. And the case of N, to which I referred uh, in my earlier presentation, highlighted this very issue where uh, the the trial judge was criticized and the point on appeal was the failure of the trial judge to assist the jury with written directions and a route to verdict. And the court of appeal uh, confirmed uh, the, that this should be uh, the approach taken in joint enterprise cases, although the appeal wasn't allowed because there was a question from the jury asking for clarification, which the Court of Appeal said clarified and um, corrected the, um, the very issue uh, that a written uh, direction and a route to verdict uh, would um, avoid. Now, I want to close off with um, some health warnings, as I call them, and um, just to throw out to us uh, the, the need and the approach that um, we should take in, in challenging uh, the narrative. Because we, as lawyers, as criminologists, as researchers, who come in contact with young black people or defendants in the criminal justice system who are presented with a narrative of gang, the, the gang um, construct or who are um, prosecuted in, in cases where joint enterprise is, is deployed, face the challenge of deploying the existing, uh, you know, legal provisions or case law, as um, Emma uh, and Ali have gone through, but it is, it is a brick wall in, in a lot of cases. Yes, the judges direct the jury on the law uh, in relation to joint enterprise, written, um, written guidance and a route to verdict is given, but we still end up with defendants being convicted and a disproportionate number of black people being um, in the prison system, in the criminal justice system because of the very factors that Becky has identified uh, significant, significantly the uh, racialization of young black defendants. And I want to throw out to you the consideration or and the need for us to have special warnings which confront the stereotypes that we are faced with in uh, joint enterprise cases where the prosecution's narrative relies solely on evidence of association to establish guilt. In particular, where a gang association is, is being relied on, where knowledge or relationship with the suspect who may or may not be um, involved in a gang is advanced. The innocent appearance in, uh, in, in music videos, you know, drill music, where we have the criminalization of black music, because that's really what it is. Tattoos and markings um, that may be very innocent uh, that are being represented as uh, gang symbols of gang affiliation to bolster uh, the prosecution's case. 
we need to have training on these issues, um, I would suggest strongly too. And in my view, judges should also confront the stereotype of racial biases in their summing up. Because unless and until we confront racialization of defendants head on, not just defense lawyers, but the judges and the prosecutors, we will continue to criminalize and imprison our black young people. And we're not gonna have that change and change is necessary. Um, we just can't continue with the state of affairs as they are. Um, so that is it uh, from my presentation. Thank you very much. All right, I, I can already hear um, people applauding out in the street in Bradford, uh, possibly all the way to where Ali is in Paris. Uh, I have been told, in fact, that is where he lives. Um, but I'd like to thank everybody who has spoken this evening. I can see on the chat and on the questions that there's been a real appreciation um, for the hard work that's gone into um, what you've talked about, the content of the slides uh, and what people have learned. I I'm going to push things a little further uh, and just keep you away from um, your dinner by just putting one or two interesting questions um, to you. Uh, and you can just maybe um, press your buzzers, because I know you have buzzers as well from Garden Court uh, to answer. Um, the uh, interesting, particularly interesting one we have, um, in fact, is from um, uh, a person who describes themselves as an aspiring prosecutor. <laughs> this is from Hannah. And she starts with a thank you, which is very much appreciated. And then she goes on to um, talk about some other issues, but ends with this. As an aspiring prosecutor, I was wondering if there are any tips the panel can give me to ensure that I carry out my role better so that I am not a participant of injustice. I think it's a great question. So um, who's going to press their buzzer first? Well, I'm going to pick Ali because I heard something go off. Ali, can you answer that question or any thoughts on it? Um, you've got to, if you're prosecuting this, and I, I put myself in a position occasionally wondering when I would make an application to adduce some of this evidence. I think I'd absolutely insist that I had hard evidence, not association with gangs. I want membership. I would rely on videos uh, in which somebody features. I would um, rely, therefore, on the hardest of evidence, insist on that being the basis for any such application. Second, be very specific as to the basis upon which I want it in. So I would, I would define precisely what issue this evidence went to meet, a, a defence that was being advanced or a particular issue that was being challenged within the trial that you wanted to advance, and this evidence directly went to that. And thirdly, I would say that I would concede that the judge has got to give a strong direction in relation to it to make sure that it doesn't form the basis of an unsafe conviction. The point just made by Thalia about um, the need for a judge to direct the jury about racial stereotypes. We now have a standard in sex cases. The judges direct the jury not to draw assumptions and stereotypes about gender issues or sometimes complainant issues that sometimes can infect a trial which involves allegations of a sexual nature. I think Thalia makes a very good point that in cases of this kind, I think that sort of direction is necessary. And that's the sort of thing that can be continued to be pressed for, sought for in our trials, if refused, made the subject of an appeal, keep trying, keep appealing. And so if you're prosecuting, I think those three features would be crucial to my performing my job in a way that I felt that I was doing it fairly. Ali, thank you. That's, that's a, I think, can I say, a brilliant answer uh, to, uh, I think, a very interesting question. And um, I'm going to move on. I could see the time and I'm going to just move on. There's another question here from John Crilly, um, who says, how is the burden of proof allowed? to be lowered for secondary parties 
foresight equals intention. And is there, and he's got two questions here, so that's a bit naughty. Is there an actual definition of what substantial injustice equates to? So again, um, who'd like to go for answering those two questions? I'm gonna to have to pick someone. Emma, how do you feel about answering those? You could just go for one question if you want. Well, it, it, it ties in with someone else's question, I think, which is whether the Court of Appeal in, in the way that they've applied the substantial injustice test are part of the problem. Substantial injustice obviously leads a lot of room for discretion, but as one of the attendees has said, it's been it's been interpreted so narrowly that we are left trapped slightly and we just have to keep challenging it because on one view you might think that substantial injustice is is, is any period of time unjustly incarcerated uh, but that's certainly not the view that, that the court of appeal have taken so uh, wrapping it all in i uh, hope in answering the substantial injustice uh, question it, it's broad it's potentially broad but it's been interpreted very narrowly and, and so we, we are coming to the end does anybody else want to because this is a a, a, a topic which i think is going to come up um in the in the months ahead certainly in 2021 uh, this issue of substantial injustice I, i'm sure that's going to happen again so uh, I don't know whether Becky or Thalia want to just um, provide a few observations on that and, and then we'll, I, I, I can smell the dinner cooking. So um, in this lovely Bradford hotel. So um, can I just any say thoughts, Becky? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the, the first question as well around the, the, the role of the prosecutor, um, myself and my colleague, Catherine Chad Chadwick, have just completed a piece of research about women um, defendants in joint enterprise cases and it, it's much more common than you might imagine we have engaged 109 women who have been convicted in joint enterprise cases in the last 15 years and there's some very particular features of those cases but what that research has allowed us to do is open up much more that earlier point of the charge the police and the CPS decision making around charge and again the opportunity is probably not taken by defence teams to challenge at that earlier charge point. Um, I think that, you know, we've been kind of letting the police and the CPS off the hook a little bit by looking at the point we get into the trial or the courtroom to try and unpick um, what becomes almost a runaway train. I mean, we've even seen judge give directions to disclude some of the gang narratives, but it's almost as if once, once that has been done, once that seed has been sown, it's in the jury's mind. And I think we have to kind of look back upstream at those at the point of charge and the representatives, um, you know, defending people at that stage in, in the police station or, you know, before the trial, pre-trial, how they can really, um, you know, challenge those prosecution decisions. Because, you know, particularly in the cases, I say, with the women where we've been able to really open that up, there's some real questions around why it wasn't charged much earlier than the trial, you know, never mind within the trial or, or during the, the kind of arguments being given in the court. So, yeah, I, I think just a response to that idea of the role of the prosecutor and and how that's challenged can i can i just come in here uh here just just very quickly um on the issue of the substantial injustice test because you know the it's 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 because it's so it's so broad in a sense and the court of appeal here has sort of narrowed it creating such a high bar um i just want to i just want to highlight um the difficulty that appellants face you know in bringing challenges arising um, from the outcome of Jogi. And it's not just, the, the consequence is not just here, but it is in the wider Commonwealth, because as you all know, and quite many of you would know, that the Jamaican, um, that there was a Jamaican case of Rodok, which was heard uh, with uh, Jogi. But so it's, it's, it's created great difficulty for, uh, for people who have been convicted under this the, the whole joint enterprise construct, construct post pre joji but just to also say that there is campaigning work around this and Jenbo has been working on the 
joint enterprise bill, as it were, to um, to challenge the issue or to 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 look at the issue of the injustice created by the bar of the uh, substantial injustice test. So I just wanted to highlight that, uh, and it's the Joint Enterprise Bill, which is a bill to amend the, the Criminal Appeal um, Act, which is on their website. So, you know, our attendees could get more information about that. So I know Care mentioned that it will be more topical in the months ahead. So I just wanted to highlight that. Brilliant. Okay, so two more questions. I'm going to answer one of them. Uh, the first is, can lawyers start to lend stronger support to the Jengba campaign? Well, the answer to that is yes. Um, and uh, if it's not happening now, it's going to happen in the very near future. So that's that done. Uh, next one is um, from Richard. Um, he asks, I wondered why the term gang is allowed to serve as a racialized substitute for organized crime group. Is there a way to challenge police expertise on gangs on this basis? And I think, in fact, Emma's um, responded. Um, so uh, she's put herself in the frame for answering this. So I'm just going to Emma very quickly. I was worried we wouldn't get to Richard, so I just responded. Yeah, no, quite right, too. Just, just to say that in the cases, particularly the recent ones in the last couple of years, there are a few where they do refer to groups as OCGs, organised crime groups, but it's quite difficult just reading case reports in isolation to be able to do a proper analysis of whether that represents a move away from the use of the term gang or whether it in fact is a manifestation of some of the racial stereotypes and is in fact groups of white uh, individuals. So that's a little tricky, but um, absolutely I agree with Richard that it is something that should be challenged. And, and when Ali and I talked about what can you do and being creative and trying to move away from such stereotyped uh, language is obviously a, a positive and, and there's not a huge difference often between them. They, they reflect associations, they reflect acting in groups, they reflect loyalty, as the prosecution would say, across. So often there's very little between them. Brilliant. So I am going to draw this to a close. And uh, again, thank you to all of the speakers. Uh, thank you to David and Amy, who you you can't see, but have been incredibly helpful for all of the webinars that we have uh, put on, and that they should be welcomed onto the stage, really. Uh, so you can round of applause uh, to them specifically. Um, here we go. So we will be back, uh, as I said at the beginning, January the 20th, uh, and it really will. I think, be a seismic shift in how we deal with drill and rap music. And it's not going to just be UK based, it's going to have speakers from the United States. And so you will get publicity for that. And that will start off another series in terms of Black Lives Matter in the criminal justice system. So thank you very much.